Good evening and welcome to tonight's special meeting of the Board of Education. Uh, this special meeting is called to, uh, to uh, vote on resolutions to put two particular millages on a May election for a sinking fund and for a technology bond. Uh, to start the order of business, Mr. Secretary, can you call the roll? Sure. President Wasserman? Here. Vice President Baker? Here. Secretary Kaminsky, I'm here. Treasurer Brandstand? Here. Member Gorton? Is absent. Member McFarland? Here. Member Vander Kelly? Here. We have six of seven. Yes. Hence a quorum. Oh, there's Yvonne. Oh, mm -hmm. And we have seven of seven. <laughs> Yvonne, stay here. Ms. <laughs> Gorton? Are you present? Are you present? Here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> it is good. Um, at this point, we'll move uh, into presentations to the board. Uh, we have no formal request to speak. If anybody would like to speak, <coughs> they're more than welcome to. Seeing none, we'll move into uh, Board of Education matters and presentations of the board, and I'll hand it over to Mr. Ellinger. Yeah, we have, I think, an interesting PowerPoint for you to uh, view tonight that addresses really some planning that's been <laughs> ongoing in the district for a number of years relative to our technology plan and preparation for, I think, the board to have a little bigger picture of why we have the need for, in particular, this uh, sinking fund. So we've asked our tech department and Mr. Valendi, who provides the uh, direct oversight for that, to uh, present that to the board prior to taking action on the recommended resolution. Thank you. I'll around a few questions and then give you a general overview at the end before uh, you bring the uh, um, proposal to uh, some kind of vote. So what we have is a few uh, technology questions that have come up and we'll give you the answers. Does Midland Public Schools have a plan for technology? Yes. Um, you will remember last spring uh, we brought to you the uh, next installment of a three-year plan, which we have to do every three years. We may do it more often than that because it is a living document. And believe it or not, technology does change uh, within three years. So we need, uh, need to make those changes. But the reality is that our technology plan goes back to 1992. And, uh, none of you were around. Maybe a few of you were involved in str uh, strategic planning. But that was actually the first uh, technology plan that was established. It was not required by the state, but it was part of that whole uh, strategic planning process. And uh, then... Uh, in 1997, we were required by the state to do a formal plan according to their uh, guidelines, including their specific information. And we needed to do that uh, on a three-year cycle, but could do it uh, in shorter cycles uh, if the need arose. And the plans are reviewed annually by the district to ensure progress uh, towards meeting our goals. In fact, if you take a look within uh, the document that is the most current technology plan, it really is very similar to many of the technology plans before that, in that some of the plans change, some of the devices change, um, some of the funding changes, which uh, impacts some of the implementation timelines that we might aim for. Uh, but the vision remains the same. And the acknowledgement that this is a living document has always remained the same. It's how we get to that um, that um, might change. But in the technology plan for many years, it has been the vision of the middle and public schools that use of technology becomes part of the educational culture so that students are prepared to reach their post-graduation goals. And so teachers, staff, and administrators are able to meet the needs of today's students. And with this caveat, a technology vision must change currently, uh, constantly to keep up with the advances that are occurring at an ever-increasing pace. For this reason, the Middle Public Schools evaluates and revises uh, this vision regularly so our students and staff do not fall behind. So we have an annual review process. We do have a process for um, updating those plans. And um, over the course of these many years through 19, uh, from 1997, we have involved a wide variety of groups to be part of that crafting uh, of the plan to get to the vision. Associate superintendents, coordinators, teachers, technology and information system managers, principals, assistant principals, community members. I know going way back, I've been uh, um, involved uh, in this committee in some of these very, very different uh, capacities um, uh, over the years. So 
It is a, a, a standard process for doing this. Step one, the committee is formed to review and make modifications to the plan. The plan is then presented to the Board of Education for approval. Actually, the uh, approval has to go through step three and four, but we bring it to the board because I think you probably will need to weigh <laughs> in on that. And the plan is submitted to the ESA for approval by um, uh, the state's mandates. And then that plan is submitted by the ESA to the MDE for final approval. And all our plans um, have been improved, uh, approved um, over the years. Um, as we go forward, if we were able to have um, a tech bond proposal, that will change the way of reaching the vision, which means we will say, no, this plan, which we uh, currently have in the context of capital outlay on the order of about $750,000 uh, a year from the general fund may change and we may be able to reach those goals in new ways, better ways, and be able to do it um, in a more expeditious manner and reach more kids uh, on a daily basis. So we've already begun scoping that out. We've had conversations with stakeholders. We have people who volunteer that uh, they will be part of putting this together after May 7th and we, uh, if we know that uh, the steps to that uh, need to be changed. What you need to understand is the total uh, <coughs> picture of all that goes into this plan. This is just about how much money it's going to cost, which device is this, uh, what year does this happen, what year does this happen. This is a broader vision. It's not design per se. It is more about the total picture of making your vision a reality. You have an executive summary, visions and goals, student achievement um, data that you're aiming for, technology delivery, community relations, collaboration, professional development, which is going to be a big part of this, supporting resources, what's the shape of your infrastructure, what changes you need to make there, technical support, how are you going to increase access over the coming years, timetables and total cost are included, and coordination of the resources, how you monitor and evaluate, and acceptable use policy, any changes. We have an acceptable use policy. We will need to make some changes, which we've been scoping out already, um, in the context of a one-to-one -one initiative. So technology is really something that has been a vision. Technology changes, our needs change, our funding change, and we try to constantly reevaluate that plan and are already scoping out that in the context of if there is a bond proposal and if it passes, um, we will then not say we're going to go on with this three-year plan. We will uh, go through um, filling out all these sections so that it meets exactly the vision that this tech bond proposal uh, tries to encompass. How far will the $20.8 million uh, go? <coughs> Legitimate question. Okay, what we've aimed for right from the very beginning is sustainability because uh, we know how quickly things change. You look back four or five years ago, what was a tablet? Okay, things do change. And if we're trying to build sustainability over a uh, course of time and you don't know what it is, you want to make sure that you are prepared to keep our students up to date, plan for that right from the beginning, and it also can help with your planning on general fund then in the context of uh, removing some pressures from the general fund into this uh, tech bond um, and uh, make appropriate budget decisions from then. You need to understand that the way that this has been planned out with the help of our financial advisors is that there will be two issuances of bonds, not uh, do the bonds at the beginning, Okay, you got that money, and uh, we'll see you in 10 years. Okay, this is an issuance at the beginning of the, um, and over a, a, a couple year period. Uh, we're spending some of that, and uh, the remainder uh, a couple years after that, and uh, an issuance of the rest of the bonds, all within the context of this total of 20.8 with a 0.88 mil average, um, so that. We can be looking at years four, five, six, and seven to replace cycles, replace devices. We don't know what the devices will be at that time. They may be more alike. They may be a little bit different. The price points may be very different. They may have gone up. 
so we can have a more up-to-date device because we can't buy devices in the first year and say it's got to last 10 years. Okay, we are looking at a second generation of devices for the students, second generation of replacing laptops for the teachers in their classrooms, second generations of projectors in the classrooms. We've installed those through uh, um, foundation and Dow Chemical money, and we have one in every classroom now, but they're not going to last 10 years. You know, we have, we're going to need to keep those recycled so that we can provide a consistent presence of this technology and use of this technology by our students over that period of time and not just feel that way for uh, two, three, four years and then we're limping uh, along just uh, trying to patch things up. As I pointed out before, it provides relief to the general fund for capital expenditures and it provides a fleet of devices for smarter uh, balance online testing required by MDE starting with 2004 and 15. This uh, tech bond proposal is for us pretty well timed because in 2014 and 2000, uh, 2014 15 school year, all testing is uh, going to be online for students in all the subject areas that they are testing. Okay? In the uh, required tests. Yes. In the required tests, right. yes. But the, the <coughs> point being is that right now, and we're, we're going to be um, um, doing a prototype of the testing in some of our schools we're going to need to try to schedule all of our students in a particular grade level for a partic particular test that can take a couple, two, three hours um, through a computer lab that might be available or computer labs that might be available. And the, the, the hazard of that as well is the classes that were scheduled, uh, which so are sometimes very particular to a course, they're not going to be able to do those courses during the period of time that we're cycling those students through. So we know for a fact that the, uh, the tablets that we are looking at um, will be consistent with the Smarter Balance online testing so students can do it at their desk with their own device. Okay, uh, we, as we have gone along and we've planned, we, tr uh, we are trying to make sure that it is completely uh, compatible with whatever future district uh, initiatives we may consider, those that are on horizon that there have been discussions about, new tech, PYP, MYP, because we don't want um, this initiative to restrict what other initiatives we may be able to do. That wouldn't be fair. Okay, a uh, question's been brought up about BYOD. That bring your own device, okay? Bring your own device is a concept that has been used in, in some schools, usually in a basis of providing uh, the opportunity for some kids to bring in their smartphones, iPods, tablets if they have them, so that they can use that as an extra resource. <coughs> but not very often is it successfully implemented with, in the context of every kid will have access to that device to do the assignments in class or the work in class or the collaboration in class because across all these devices, the only common thing really is the uh, opportunity to use a browser. But the apps are different, et cetera. The and here's, uh, the, uh, for somebody who's worked at an at-risk school, this is a, a big thing to me. Um, our future is going to be, if we do not provide consistent as uh, um, access to technology in the schools, there will be kids that will become the technology have-nots and those that will be the haves. The future uh, for our kids when they leave minimum public schools is going to rest partly on their ability to use technology as a tool for continued learning. And so we need to make sure that all have access. Many of our kids will go home to um, um, rooms that will have a desktop computer, et cetera. But we do have those out there that don't. And um, even in those cases that we do sometimes, it's not always they don't have access geographically or because of um, home budgets or whatever do not have access to internet. Okay, the, having a computer and having the internet are not exactly the same thing, obviously. So we will still need to provide a uh, device if we do not want to exacerbate uh, the concept of technology have-nots and technology haves. As you all know, and this is what you, um, the reason you ran for this board, we are about making decisions for all kids. So the consistency, consistency also allows 
teacher to, to develop a mobile skill set. Okay, we have common device, common apps, or common applications. <coughs> we can concentrate on those rather than, especially if you have some teachers who are not quite as advanced as the others, uh, trying to learn apps or applications or how to operate devices uh, that are six or seven different devices in a classroom, and then some students may be without some of them. The lesson plans can be targeted to the device or app. I know uh, uh, three of our board members had a chance to visit out at Chestnut Hill when we took you on a tour. Uh, the fifth graders were so proud to show you what they were doing in that uh, class. But notice that they all had common apps within their classrooms that were grade level appropriate and for the content they had. And it was the commonality of those apps that allowed the teacher and student to effectively and efficaciously um, uh, share their learning, their knowledge, et cetera. Uh, comfort level for teachers and uh, students, knowing that we have a common device, not knowing what the other device is like. Uh, the world of uh, um, iOS is very different than the world of Android and other things. And, uh, you know, there are some people that need to concentrate on the one device because they don't have that broad depth of experience. And for peer support, one of the things that we saw I think out at Chestnut Hill the other day is um, the teachers are, uh, the students are not just the learners. They're the teachers. They're showing the other kids how to use the apps. They're showing the teachers how to use uh, some of these apps. They're sharing what they've learned. That is very important and it's much more efficient if we have a common device. And quite honestly, with BYOD, it's not very practical for elementary and middle school students. Not many of them have phones with um, 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 <coughs> wireless or uh, a data pack, okay? A lot of parents don't feel comfortable necessarily with that at an elementary level um, or a middle grades level. Secondly, stop and think. We may have some families who may be uh, challenged in this these tough times and have three kids in the school, okay? Provi needing to provide three devices for that family um, is very different than to provide <coughs> for one. Okay, the other things to know about BYOD, District issue Wi-Fi devices uh, can be filtered. Okay, one of the things that we've heard most from parents in one-on-one -on -one conversations about the iPad initiative is what made them feel the most comfortable um, uh, and was a point of questioning at the beginning is um, the fact that we can filter these through a proxy. So that the kids' uh, devices are filtered outside of the building uh, the same as if they were inside of our building. Okay, 3G, 4G cellular devices can't be filtered. And some kids may come in with data packs and 3G and 4G devices, but they could be interacting and sharing things with other students, but we have no control of that. Supportability, we need to understand that if we have multiple platforms, especially when you're talking about phones, tablets, iPads, et cetera, we're gonna need more resources uh, for that. Help desk, uh, MDM, building support, uh, because uh, you need to have some people with experience within the building, and we've started to build that with the iPad initiative, uh, who can help uh, rather than putting in an, uh, an order or a ticket and hope that um, somebody can help you in a day or two. And uh, in, with a, BOY, a BYOD approach, each student then is responsible for maintenance and repairs. And I know you probably all have experienced this. Phone's not working right, or you drop it, you crack the screen. Most parents uh, would need, uh, if we are not providing a device, they're going to need to do that. Sometimes that can be a real delay uh, because, as we uh, quite well know, some of those damages can be pretty <coughs> expensive. Okay, so which device is best for MPS in this tech bond? Good question. No final decision has been made. We have been looking at all kinds of devices, researching them. We have prototypes of some of these in here. We've um, used them for a period of time. We look at uh, whether they meet the, our needs. Then look at the sp we look at the specifications and see what is compatible with different types of programs we might use, different type of initiatives we may want to uh, go forward with. And no <laughs> final decision has been made because um, we've always left open that it may not be the same device all the way K through 12. Maybe just for an example, a tablet at the high schools, and we may find uh, through our iPad initiative and other things that a mini tablet might serve some of the younger kids better. It'll be the same across grade levels and probably, you know, just 
uh, school level, but it could be different at um, uh, another level. We're going to continue to watch what the developments are before we uh, make the, the final decisions and start deploying. Um, and quite honestly, there will be different tablets come out, different versions and capabilities uh, just here in the spring. So we want to uh, keep an eye on that. Also, um, this tech bond proposal um, is fresh. Uh, it is fresh in our mind that if we find uh, funding sources within the community to do a new tech, the new tech relies on a laptop model. Okay, doesn't mean that you have to have a laptop K through 12 or all secondary, but in the context of those eventual 400 kids, that that suits the needs because of the specifics of the ecosystem through new tech, et cetera. Now, the request for that uh, funding for the new tech does include the uh, uh, funds for purchasing of laptops, but we uh, uh, can't be um, naive enough to think that those things will last 10 years. So this uh, tech bond proposal has built in, after those start to get older, a refresh of those at the end cycle of this eight to 10 year period. Okay, so it, it is built so that it can be consistent with new tech, but secondly, so that it can support it um, after uh, those monies uh, that we may uh, get eventually uh, through the generosity of our community, um, that we would be able to keep it and sustain it, which goes back to the first slide. <coughs> we must be cost effective here. Uh, there, a lot of the prices between, uh, on the devices can really vary. But to give you the general range, the iPad, depending on whether you're going with 16 gigabytes Wi-Fi or you're going up to 128 gig, um, those prices can vary. Right now we're using the six, uh, 16 gig and just Wi-Fi, no cellular, uh, which is the entry level, and it's serving us fine. Uh, we had, we've had no problems with that. And, uh, but you could go top of the line and go up to 799. MacBook uh, uh, Pro Air uh, has a little bit better battery life than a lot of the other laptops. Uh, but those run from 999 to 1199, and that's a, a, a quite different price. And we have on here the 829 for the HP 6570B, which is our standard issue uh, laptop that we are currently using. Um, if we were to go further with that and use that with students or new tech or whatever the case may be, that decision to be made. So um, you need to understand we have reached out over the course of this whole semester to me some of our stakeholders, our teachers in our classrooms, okay? And we went around, we obviously had these uh, very open conversations with the elementary teachers who have been part of this iPad initiative and we've shared uh, um, uh, that conversation with others within our elementary. But in our secondaries, we did uh, at each building a meeting and an all call for anybody who wanted to have their voice heard about the future of technology. And if we were able to go with a tech bond, okay, what is it that they want? Now, we're not looking at the name of a product or how many gigabytes or anything like that, but we're looking at this as to, okay, w give us some direction as to what's going to meet the needs of the kids and you in your classroom. And we started out with the question is, what is, the, what is it the kids need to do? Okay, what kind of device would help them do it? And what are the things that we have to keep in mind as we make these decisions going forward uh, to make um, that experience a wonderful instructional experience in the classroom? And it's amazing. Um, five separate meetings at our secondaries, all done. Uh, we collected all the notes. Chris made sure he got it all. They all agreed on the same themes. And when you compare the five, pretty much consensus. And it is. Um, that whatever device is used for the student should be the same as the teacher device. It should be mobile and easy to use. It should have a longer battery life because they're concerned <coughs> about it making it to the end of the day. And the, um, you know, uh, you could look at, well, you could recharge some of those power strip extension cords. But that's not very practical and, uh, with 25 kids in a classroom and across all classrooms um, in the district. Okay, it's got to be consistent for all students. That came through loudly and clearly. Lightweight and durable. Okay, when we're talking about durable, uh, the iPad initiative 
that's been a wonderful experience uh, with our Garmin um, military grade um, protector on it. We have had two um, iPads that have been damaged. One, the screen was a fluke accident. Uh, the screen was cracked, and then the other one, uh, one of the earbud uh, connectors um, broke off inside, and we were able to fix that. But that's been the extent after these eight weeks uh, of using the classroom and letting kids take them home. That's been uh, the extent of it. And we've also, with that one cracked one, we, we wanted to see how well this would hold up. And so Chris and Blake had the, uh, we couldn't uh, repair that one. So they had the uh, fun of tossing it all around the parking lot outside, seeing what it would take to break it. And uh, they, came, they came back in uh, pretty worn out. Okay, <laughs> 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 has to have a small footprint. One of the things that we know about some of the laptops is they're so big, you can just take up your desk. Okay, where, where do you put anything else? Uh, teachers uh, have said it needs to be cost effective and there needs to be flexibility for individualized learning. And I think we saw some of that on some of the board members out at Chestnut Hill yesterday. And uh, th they really uh, think that there's value in having a device that can replace all the other devices that we have, okay, which have been exciting uh, multimedia opportunities for students. Uh, annotating documents. We have the interactive whiteboards, which we've uh, used in the past, but those are stationary. Um, and it, uh, they can be bulky, and only one person can be at it at a time. We have the document cameras. Tablets are a document camera. Uh, audience response system. The um, tablet is an audio response system. We saw examples of that over at Chestnut Hill. Video and voice recording, but one strong message from all the staff is they want it to support, be supported uh, uh, by smarter balance assessment. Okay, which email service is required for new tech? That, that issue has come up. And this is the technology requirements and recommendations for the ECHO uh, new tech <coughs> network. And I'm, I know that that box at the bottom there is hard to read. We just want to show the full document. And basically it says you need to establish a mail domain your staff and students that meets the following criteria. It should be unique to the school. Uh, so if you have a new tech school, you could have um, our uh, domain be, uh, we have MTS K12.mi.us. We could have it be MTS new tech for these particular kids that are in that program, no problem. The mail do m domain must be the same for staff and students. We can do that very easily, uh, even with our exchange program. But most importantly, um, new text um, document there shows us is to determine whether your school will use Google Apps mail for staff and students. Now, look, for clarification, Google Apps, Apps is sort of a suite of different applications, okay, which could include Google Docs, Google Gmail. The whole suite is actually called Vault if you get the, the full one where you can maintain the security on your, on your own archive, et cetera. But um, if you decide not to use Google Apps mail and use district-provided mail, ensure that these mail accounts use the same unique domain as described above. It's not prescribed. In fact, actually, when we had the conversation <coughs> with Paul Buck and some of the senior people over there, New Tech uses Exchange for their, um, their email. Okay, but the Google Apps is preferred <coughs> by New Tech because it's collaborative. There are other possibilities. Within our own uh, office suite, we have SharePoint. That could be possible. But Google Apps is not a problem. You don't have to have um, Gmail to use the Google Apps. I know I've got uh, uh, accounts with Google Apps. Other teachers here in the district have that. That is the key point here, is that to be able to be collaborative through that Google Apps. And that's mainly what New Tech is getting at not uh, necessarily that we have one Gmail service and then have to provide it to all students and all staff. And especially if we go to uh, Gmail, we would have to change, uh, we, we would not have control um, over securing that. So let's uh, go over again. We showed you uh, some of this in percentages last time, but uh, what's included in the tech bond proposal? This is basically it in this broad category. Infrastructure and security, okay? 
not a very sexy title, obviously, but it, what it does is it, that security technology we talked to you about, wireless refresh, okay, the uh, routers that we have in our buildings that we've just put in thanks to uh, donations from our community, we can't count necessarily that those specs and those devices are going to hold up through 10 years. The worst thing that can happen is we've got um, the devices holding up, but we can't get the wireless access. Okay, so we want to make sure that we stay up on this. We have some network electronics. We're also trying to make some changes in how the, our fiber set up, set up a few loops so that we're not vulnerable. That if at a certain school there's a, a problem with the line, we can reroute and continue on with business. Uh, very important, especially when you're going to become so uh, dependent upon that on an hour by hour basis. Okay, classroom multimedia. What this boils down to is in every classroom, we will have the projectors similar to what we have up here. We have them in all the classrooms now, but we'll need to uh, keep uh, replacing or refreshing them. And Apple TV, which is a small box or something like Apple TV, small box that's connected there. It's got HDMI cables, and it allows us, without a TV screen or anything, to wirelessly take my presentation here if it was on the tablet, project it onto here and show it to you. And if Scott wanted to show me something uh, similar that um, he's found on it, we can just switch over and Scott can go up there wirelessly from an iPad if he had one, just as an example. Okay, we realize that there are going to be some specialized uh, needs for desktops or laptops uh, with some of our programs, graphic arts. Okay, actually we need to upgrade that because uh, right now we're kind of a, a baseline on power there. So we're going to... That's built into this. CAD labs, we've got some of the web design uh, labs we're going to need to uh, update and still keep those. Uh, teacher devices, they're going to have a laptop and a tablet. They already have the laptops, but we'll continue into an, uh, another generation there. They will have the same devices as the students, and I'm sure you can appreciate how critical that is. Students will have the mobile device for every K through 12 student. Um, if we have new tech, they would have uh, laptops, but we are providing in the funding here for a refresh at the very end of the cycle here so that we don't get caught uh, not being able to sustain that. Okay? And then contingency and professional services. We've had uh, already legal representation, financial consultants. We need to get the bonds sold. We have design services, a whole variety of things uh, we need to you know, have all the RFPs, need the spec uh, specifications uh, through our uh, consultant here. We need to do all the accounting that's uh, available with this, and that's all part of that grand total. So it adds up to $20,800,000. We believe it provides an exciting new opportunity for students in a very powerful way to increase instruction and build some sustainability over a period of the next eight to ten years, and lastly, also not have us um, be constricted by all the pressures on the general fund um, that we have seen and having to implement year by year by year by year, and then when we get uh, further along, we've got to change plans because the technology has changed. It seems to be more forward thinking, at least in our mind. Questions for Mr. Valindi. Yes. Mr. Valindi, about two years ago, the board policy allowed for bring your own device, use your own device in classes. Um, I think at the time, uh, Mr. Sobel wasn't here yet. Mr. Saberin was handling that. How do we, how do we come up with uh, a way, since these devices are, are in many places, uh, you know, the, the limitations are which you outlined and illustrated. So we've had that for about a year, year and a half. I haven't heard that they're being used on a prolific rate no, level for and those quite reasons. A, quite honestly, and I think Chris might be able to address this as well. Quite honestly, that we was a change. That was a change in our policy. We didn't allow any of those devices to use phones, right. etc. Okay, yep. we tried to allow that in certain circumstances with approval of the teacher mm -hmm. and uh, the principal in specific activities at a grade level for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a, uh, an opportunity to try out some of this in limited activities. And so uh, in some cases, uh, 
uh, students, uh, teachers had their students bring uh, their phones in and they use it as a clicker or audience response type of thing. Very limited, but it was a good way of demonstrating for that particular activity. Um, but again, we ran into the situation there were kids who didn't have phones to bring in. Exactly. Okay, and then they had to design instruction that either they shared a phone together or w looked over each other's shoulders or there was an alternate way um, of doing this. So we've done it in a limited manner. But what we did when we changed the policy is allow that experimentation mm -hmm. and those opportunities, but not, I think your point's exactly right, not in a very prolific manner. And, and it didn't seem like it had the potential. I'm sure, Blake, you would have identified if, if that had greater potential, but it didn't really materialize as far as being something that took off and allowed for that to happen in classrooms on a very large scale, thus the reason for the one-to-one -one study and recommendation, and if I understand that correctly. So I, I think we've kind of tiptoed and yep. tested the waters as we've gone along, and um, so I just wanted to bring that up to the public that we've we've uh, tested that and and uh, surveyed that what it uh, would do in the district. Any other questions or concerns for Gary? I'd say well done. Yeah. Absolutely great Speaking job. Speaking of pleasure, it's very well done. It's been a and also definitely a multi-month, if not multi-year effort. <coughs> it's got well-defined scope of what we're trying to do, yet flexibility in terms of not anchoring into a device, uh, especially for application in terms of new tech or especially high school classes and things of that <coughs> nature. So that's perfect. Okay. If there are no further questions on the presentation, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Allinger for moving to the next part of our agenda. Yeah, just uh, before we actually get to the technology and the sinking fund resolution, <coughs> just some introductory comments. Um, this board has had discussion um, <coughs> in particular through the Finance Facilities and Operations um, Study Committee of the board for I would say the better part of two years. That's a committee that Linda provides oversight for and works um, uh, with whoever the treasurer of the board is at the time and it, it happens to be Angela this year. So our recommendation to you tonight, and this isn't a surprise to any of our board members, is that after getting approval from the Department of Treasury that we got um, officially last week, um, it's necessary to take action tonight given the timelines that we have to have for proper election notification and development of the ballot language and so on. And you have a copy of that um, at your places, and I think we sent it to you electronically. Uh, it's important that we take this action tonight because we only have about a week in which we can um, take that action. I want you to know, however, that at the recommendation of the FFO, we just didn't pick this May 2013 election date out of the blue because there are other options. In the change in the election law, you can hold an election in February, um, March, August, and November. But there's good reasons that we're asking the board to consider this for this May, and that has to do when you look at other millages that are coming due in the future, both for our district and the county because we will have to ask the voters for what school districts typically do all over the state of Michigan to renew their operational millage. That is an election because we're a hold harmless district and that would cost us quite a bit of income. Linda can probably quote the amount. Um, that election is facing us within the next couple of years as well. There is a countywide enhancement election that we're in, I believe, the fourth year of. And there's been no decisions made, I think, by the local boards of the ESA. But will there be a continuation of that? And where does that fit into the timeline? So I think the longer we delay giving some what would really be considerable relief to our general fund, both for capital investments in the district from having another 10-year sinking fund at the same millage that that 10-year sinking fund has been for the past 10 years up until uh, the winter uh, tax collections of this year, to extend that out for another 10 years uh, becomes a little less burdensome or it's not like a new tax on the voters because they're used to paying for that in some fashion. Um, uh, w without the investment that this board used to have of a million to two million a year in a reserve to take care of capital funds, we're in serious problems. So I think our community understands the urgency of that. The second thing is with a technology bond that instantly gives relief to the, to the general fund uh, with another source for those expenditures. And it certainly isn't going to be our recommendation that that savings in the general fund go into expenditures because we really have to mind our P's and Q's as we prepare for the budget challenges that we still face as a district. 
So I would ask you to keep in mind that I think it's important. Um, it's not um, just my recommendation to you that we hold this election in May. That's coming from the previous board after months, if not two years, uh, of study and the timing of when we should approach our community um, for the timing of this election. And I just want to say publicly that I know a number of us at this table, uh, given the financial challenges that we've gone through in recent years, have had community members approach us saying, Mr. Ellinger, some of us are as frustrated by funding for public education at the state level as many local school districts are. We are one of those districts that I think has um, uh, heard the message from our community that is probably considered a fiscally conservative one. And we have not um, uh, increased wages for our staff um, hardly at all in my six years of being here. They have paid more for their benefit package. We, I think, are one of those lighthouse districts that the legislature would say, given our reduction in revenue, we have had to make some of the tough choices, even when, it, even when it comes to salary and benefits, and how we have to make tough decisions from privatizing services to reductions of some programs, um, and you all know what they are. Um, I think we're a district that the state would say, this district has done its job to come to grips with what a lot of businesses in this um, state are coming to grips with, and that's a tough economic climate but it's gonna get more difficult to find reductions in savings in the general fund if we don't have millages like this that help with the revenue. And what I and a number of you are hearing from the community is we can't impact this on a statewide level, but Mr. Ellinger, why doesn't the board, why don't you recommend to the board that you come to us locally and let us do what we can and the community would have a strong voice in telling us if they support these um, uh, two proposals that we would suggest you have on, on the May election. Um, we've also had a survey um, that we did, the Cobalt survey, that was really the most comprehensive survey that we have done as a district in uh, probably a decade uh, or, or more. Um, that survey came back with very strong support. Um, uh, in some places over 50 percent, in a lot of places 49 or 50 when we had that company review the survey results with us here with a little bit more information and things like the sinking fund and investment in a new tech program. Uh, there was references to a pool and so on that could, could be addressed in this sinking fund improvements to the pool. With just a little more information in a lot of these areas, two thirds of the respondents on this survey said that they want the opportunity to weigh in and hopefully lend us their support. So. I don't think we bring this recommendation to you in any lighthearted manner. I think we've done our homework. I think we've engaged our community and we can demonstrate that. So as we move into these resolutions, I just wanted to remind all of you in our community of the homework that we've done to prepare for this. Thanks, Carl. You stole a lot of my thunder for the comment period. Um, <laughs> so, Sorry. So, no, it's great. You did Better on the front end. Probably more succinct afterwards. than I could do. <laughs> and from a process standpoint, um, what we do now is, is ask for a motion for a resolution. Uh, we'd have John read the resolution, and then we can have discussion about that resolution and move on to a vote. So I'll entertain a motion for a resolution for a technology bond. I make a motion that we have a resolution for a technology bond. Moved by Treasurer Branstad and supported by Member McFarland. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, John, would you please read the resolution? Sure. A special meeting of the Board of Education, the Board of the District, was held at the Administration Center boardroom in the district on this 20th day of February 2013 at 5.30 p.m. in the evening. Uh, the meeting was called to order by Jerry Wasserman, board president. Members present was uh, member Baker, Brandstant, Gordon, Kaminsky, McFarland, Vander Callen, and Wasserman. The following preamble and resolution were offered by member um, Brandstant and uh, supported by member McFarland. Got that right, Looking on my feet. Uh, whereas number one, uh, in the opinion of this board, it is necessary and expedient to acquire and install instructional technology for school facilities, remodel and equip and re-equip school facilities for technology purposes, and develop and improve sites for technology purposes. And number two, this board estimates the necessary cost of this project to be twenty million nine hundred eleven thousand five hundred and one dollars. And number three, it will be necessary for the district to borrow the sum of twenty million eight hundred eighty thousand dollars and to issue the bonds of the district, therefore, the remaining funds to be derived from the investment of the bonds proceeds and 
Uh, number four, the bond, uh, the board intends to submit one proposition at a special election to be held on Tuesday, May 7th, 2013. And number five, on or before 4 p.m. on Tuesday, February 26, 2013, the board shall certify any ballot proposition to be submitted to the voters at such election to the election coordinator or coordinators designated to conduct elections within the district, uh, quote, the election coordinator. Now, therefore, it be resolved that, number one, a special election of the electors of the district be called and held on Tuesday, May 7, 2013. Um, the proposition to be voted on at the special election shall be stated on the ballots and substantially the form as set forward in Exhibit A. Uh, number three, the election coordinator is requested to um, A, utilize Middle and Daily News, a newspaper published of uh, a general circulation within the district for publication of notices in accordance with election law requirements. Uh, 3B, utilize ballot proposition summary information as prepared by legal counsel in the form of this notice on the last day of registration and notice of election in the form as set forth in Exhibit B attached here too. Uh, 3C, provide a proof copy of the ballot to the district and its legal counsel in sufficient time to allow the ballot to be proofread prior to printing. Um, number four, this board estimates the period of usefulness of the improvements for the bonds of the district in the amount of $20,880,000 are to be issued to be not less than eight years. Uh, number five, the secretary of the board is hereby authorized to direct and file a copy of this resolution with the election coordinator and with any election clerk or clerks designated to conduct elect elections uh, within the district by 4 p.m. on Tuesday, February 6, 2013. Uh, number six, all resolutions and parts of resolutions insofar as they conflict with the provisions of this resolution uh, B and same are hereby rescinded. And I believe we have a roll call vote. Just one clarification in uh, number five. Um, oh. That should have read uh, February 26th, not 6th. Just to clarify. Oh. Easy. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought you said 26, actually. I, yeah. I think yeah. he verbalized. We'll clarify February 26th for uh, item number five. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Uh, resolution has been read. Questions or comments? None. I was going to say, I, I had some comments, but you all pretty much yep. <laughs> expressed my same feelings <laughs> on why this is important and what it can do for the general budget and that timing is of the essence right now to do it now so that as we go into our budget planning for even next year, if we know that this is in place, it will be a different approach to budget planning for the next school year even. Mm -hmm. Any others? John. I do have some comments. I was, Mr. Villani, it was interesting how you took us from the beginning with when we looked at our technology plan. Um, the plan that we have now looks a lot different than when I came in the district. And that was one of my goals uh, coming in as a board member. And I remember when, uh, Mr. Sabrin, you were trying to get this plan together and this is before Mr. Sobel came on as our technology uh, director and consultant and so it's just really come a long way I'm impressed with how the administration's done the homework um, looking at developing the plan um, looking at uh, polling the public uh, with the cobalt survey um, you know really looking at doing the iPad initiative to try to find out not just what that shiny new technology is but to actually test the waters see not just how can that be used in education but to test it in this district and find out how is it a good fit for us how is it a good fit as far as the apps and be realistic, give it some soak time and so forth. And so I really appreciate that. Um, I like the emphasis on security. I, I like the emphasis on having the input from families and teachers about filtering uh, some of the devices and, and also some of the compatibilities going forward. Um, I really like that. And then also in the, the tech bond, the emphasis on security uh, for the schools. If we can uh, reinforce using technology solutions because Obviously, we have less resources to do that. Technology tends to be, once it's implemented, an efficient way to uh, do things, uh, monitor security and so forth in our buildings. So I think that that's really important. Um, I like the piece on sustainability, too, and the replacement part. It's, I think it's really well thought through. So I really appreciate all the work that went into this. It makes our decision sort of easy in a way. Thank you. Any others? Um, I, I'll make a quick one. Ditto to everything said by, by, by John, Gary, and Carl. Uh, it, I think it's a great plan. It's got flexibility, as I said earlier, yet we know where we're headed. And it's going to enable us to move into 21st century education, which I know is a buzzword, but, but 
is going to allow new delivery ways, either more effective delivery or more efficient delivery of education as we go forward. And that, that's, that's perfect as, as the world turns from chalkboards uh, to going forward. That said, I don't take it lightly that we are asking the taxpayers for these dollars. And I'll repeat this when we get to the sinking fund. Um, I hope the electorate appreciates uh, that we have been good stewards in the past, that uh, when bad economic times came and we needed operating funds, we asked for those, but we were relieved on the, on the other side with the sinking fund, and we recognize the situation that we'd be putting families into and businesses into in terms of taxation. This is now going to be additional taxes, uh, additional payments. They're not that large. Uh, they'll be considered large by some and not by others. But the bang for the buck we're going to get in terms of moving education forward in Midland and where our community, as Carl said, has been saying, please find us a way to help. Please give us the opportunity to say yes or no to moving forward. And so we're now presenting that electorate that choice. And I hope we've earned your trust that uh, we have a great plan, that we've managed it well in the past, and we'll manage it in the forward. And when we look back a decade from now, our kids will have had a heck of an experience, a world competitive experience in education in middle public schools. Okay. That said, we'll move into a roll call vote. Mr. Secretary. Okay. President Wasserman. Yes. <clears throat> Vice President Baker. Yes. Secretary Kaminsky. Uh, yes. Treasurer Brandstamp. Yes. Member Gorton. Yes. Member McFarlane. Yes. Member Vanderkellen. Yes. Very good. 7 0. Thank you, board. And hopefully, we can say thank you to the taxpayers in May. So, we look forward to seeing you, uh, taxpayers, and questions you have. Please ask questions as we go forward, and, uh, and uh, we'll be glad to answer those as we go forward. Carl, I'll turn it over to the sinking, sinking fund. Uh, you can read the resolution. I mean, I would just be repeating the rationale yep. for why we think the timing and, and the reason for it um, was previously stated. Okay. So. Mr. So, Secretary. Okay. I think we have a shorter one this time, so. Okay. So, a special meeting of the Board of Education, uh, the board of the district was held in the administration boardroom on the, the district the 20th day of February 2013 at 5.30 p.m. The meeting was called to order by President Jerry Wasserman, members present, members Baker, Brandstant, Gordon, Kaminsky, McFarland, Vanderkellen, and Wasserman. Um, the following preamble and resolution were offered by uh, member uh, I don't know if we had a, a motion. Oh, uh, or, or, I'm sorry. We do have to. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. We'll start with yeah. I apologize. Uh, can I have a motion to entertain a resolution for a sinking fund millage? So moved. Member McFarland has moved, and Treasurer Brandstadt has okay. support. We'll Please now we'll read the resolution. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's that's why these blanks, and that's why everything is in there to Thank make you. sure that I apologize that we follow. You, you can start where you left off. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. So we'll resume. Uh, we're reading the follow preamble and resolution. We're offered by member I think uh, McFarland and supported by member Brandstant. Whereas, number one, the board intends to submit one additional uh, proposition at a special election to be held on Tuesday, May 7, 2013. And number two, on or before 4 p.m. on Tuesday, February 26, 2013, the board shall certify any ballot uh, proposition to be submitted to the voters at such election to the election coordinator or coordinators designated to conduct elect elections within the district, uh, quote, the election coordinator. Now, therefore, it be resolved that, number one, a special election of the electors of the district be called and be held on Tuesday, May 7, 2013. Number two, the additional proposition to be voted on at the special election shall be stated on the ballots and substantially the form is set forth in Exhibit A with that proposition to be listed second on the ballot to the district's bonds proposition. Number three, the election coordinator is requested to, number one, utilize Midland Daily News, a newspaper published or, uh, or a general circulation within the district for publication of notices in accordance with the election law requirements. Number two, utilize ballot proposition summary information as prepared by legal counsel in the form of the notice of the last day of the registration and notice of election in the form as set forth in Exhibit B attached here too. Number three, provide a proof of copy of the ballot to the district and its legal counsel in sufficient time to allow the ballot to be proofread prior to printing. Number four, the secretary of this board is hereby authorized and directed to file a copy of this resolution with the election coordinator and with any election clerk or clerks designated to conduct elect elections within the district by 4 p.m. on Tuesday, February 26, 2013. Number six, all resolutions and part of resolutions insofar as they conflict with provisions of this resolution be and the same are hereby rescinded. 
Okay, I've said resolution. Uh, comments, questions, discussion. I do have some comments. Um, go up. And since there are no others, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> press on. I, I don't want to be a one man show here or, or late, one woman show. But, um, so, um, you know, with the sinking fund, you know, I'm keeping in mind with this is that the buildings are definitely older. There is a requirement. I think it's cheaper than building new buildings. I think we brought that up in FFO. Um, the, the enormous cost of building new buildings versus maintaining what we have. Um, I, and, and I keep in mind that w the necessary uh, um, getting this to the voters. Um, I think of this as also with the new tech part, um, science lab, lab renovations and new tech um, um, potential um, help from that. Um, looking at 21st century, Mr. Wasserman recommend or mentioned that, and I thought that that was important. Um, I think that uh, you know also looking at the uh, cobalt uh, survey that was done, I think that the support uh, was definitely there um, with and continuing to improve the district. I think it's responsible, um, and I and I also my thoughts were as we have exercise restraint on not uh, funding or asking for the full amount, which I think is very sensitive, and and just kind of in the summary. Looking at the tech bond and the sinking fund, and this is a chance for Midland to bring the spoon to their own mouths and be able to help out. And it doesn't necessarily um, relate to Lansing helping giving us funds. And I think that this is a real, it's a great opportunity for us to bring this to the voters. Uh, this is how we can improve um, not just technology, but also sinking fund and continue to uh, keep up our standard that we're used to with education. So I just think it's, this is our opportunity and I hope we, I hope we make something of it. If I, if I could add, I know we went through the whole technology and where all the money was going to go. And the same process, just for anyone who hasn't realized this, was done for the sinking fund. So the um, amount was just not ar arbitrarily arrived at. So there's, you know, it was a well thought out process and how it came up with um, two mills. And from our meeting, when just uh, last Monday was it? Um, there's a PowerPoint on the sinking fund too for anyone watching on TV or in the audience if they want to review that they can see the major areas that the sinking fund would address in our facilities throughout the district. So just as an FYI. Yep. And uh, again, I'll add thank you to the taxpayers for the last decade of support. There's been a small gap in here on purpose uh, to facilitate the plans of what we have to do with our facilities with technology and integrating that in, in new ways of uh, delivering education like new tech and having all that dust settle so we knew where we were going versus asking for money and just continuing spending to spend. Um, the, other, the other thing I'd like to point out, and it was already pointed out, the age of our buildings. This is a much more capital efficient way of keeping our facilities, not only with good mechanical integrity, but also enhancing security in buildings that were designed not with security in mind at, at all in their days. Remember, they been back in 1968, and I don't think people were worried about things with weapons and schools in 1968. And, and uh, this will help us deal with those issues. Um, lastly, the vast majority of this money, just like the last sinking fund, um, is, you know, the old joke, uh, the, the teeth are great, but the gums are going. We're spending money on gums. Um, a lot of this is infrastructure things that, yeah, while somewhat visible, not necessarily visible, that keep the buildings from leaking, that keep the energy costs down that uh, provide adequate lighting, those kind of things. That's the vast majority of the money. And then the rest of the money, as Angela pointed out, are almost equally divided between sciences, arts and drama, athletics, swimming, and um, I've lost one in my head here, that are pretty much evenly distributed, just would have seen last night or last week in the presentation. So I feel good that, again, just like technology, when you look, I always try to make these decisions of what am I going to look back on a decade from now? And I sit there and go, this now will have, still have great facilities a decade from now. We wouldn't have spent a lot of taxpayer money on a new facility or new facilities uh, as we're going forward. And it's a very capital efficient way. As this works out, Linda, if I'm not mistaken, into somewhere, call it two-ish percent, a little less or a little more than 2% of our replacement asset uh, base of our buildings. It's a very small continuing reinvestment to keep these things alive over a decade, so it's a very efficient way, and I hope our taxpayers will support us in doing so. That said, we can move into a roll call vote. Okay, very good. President Wasserman? Yes. Vice President Baker? Yes. Secretary Kaminsky? Yes. Treasurer Brantat? Yes. Member Gordon? Yes. Member McFarland? Yes. Member Vanderkelp? Yes. 
Very good. 7-0 on the sinking fund. Thank you very much, board members. Uh, and again, thank you. Thank you in the past to the taxpayers and looking forward to being able to thank you in May for the future funding. Um, that ends the formal part of the agenda. Uh, I would open up for any comments from the good of the order. Seeing none, we stand adjourned.